Greetings, fans. We'd like to begin today's episode of the Dave Dynasty Show by acknowledging a loss in the Midwest wrestling community, particularly to one of today's guests. On this episode's Whatever Happened to, we have Dude Kind, uh, which is Charlie Garland, and recently Charlie lost his mother, Lois, who was a mainstay uh, in shows in this area here in central Indiana. Uh, many years ago when Charlie wrestled, uh, she would come to all the shows, uh, support Charlie, support his friend Brad, his his friend Andy. Uh, her husband recorded a lot of the shows. They were just avid supporters of the scene at that time, particularly of Charlie and his friends. Uh, and it's a great loss. Uh, we lose a fan, lose a member of the family like that. Uh, here at the Dave Dynasty Show, we'd like to send out our condolences to Charlie, all of his family, all of his friends, and everyone. And in the time under tradition of professional wrestling losses, we'd like to take a moment to do a 10-bill salute in honor of Lois Garland. Supporting, bruiser loving, positivity spreading, world's most dangerous podcast. Join former pro wrestler and promoter Dave Dynasty as he supports and promotes Midwest pro wrestling. Keep on growing with the Midwest Express. This is the Dave Dynasty Show. Your readings fans, and welcome to the Dave Dynasty Show. I am your host, Dave Dynasty. Thank you for joining us for another packed full episode of Midwest Pro Wrestling Goodness. I am Downtown Dave, Delicious Dave, the blind boy of Indiana, the mouth of the Midwest, and Mr. Midwest. Call me what you will. I'll answer to about anything. Uh, even some not so, uh, some unsavory names. That <laughs> wouldn't be the first time. Thank you once again for joining us, whatever platform you do. Whether it be on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, whatever it may be, we're on all the podcast platforms, whichever means you do. Thank you. And uh, wherever you are, however you find us, make sure you like, subscribe, follow, share, uh, rate, review us, do all those things, help support the Dave Dynasty Show in what we do. Um, we have a good show for you here today. Uh, we have, actually, we've got a whole string of great shows coming up. I mean, I am so excited about some of the stuff that is coming on the Dave Dynasty Show, beginning with today. Uh, we have an hour-long interview with Sexy Sean Casey, and he was joined by Big John Murray. Uh, it was such a great interview, so much fun. Uh, we have a Whatever Happened To with Dude Kind, Charlie Garland. Uh, I, I will apologize in advance. There, there's some sound quality issues in some of these, particularly in the Dude Kind. I, I don't know what was going on with that. Uh, I, I put in on the reason the episode is so late is because I put in so much time trying to edit, trying to get this cleaned up, and I, and I did a lot. Uh, it's still not really where we would like it to be, but we're going to go ahead and put it out there. Uh, and I apologize in advance to DuKind and, and everyone to listening to that. Uh, hopefully you still enjoy it. Hopefully you still take a lot from it. Uh, we are going to try to sort through some of those issues. I don't know what's going on. Uh, Ike and his interviewing, it might just be that, that, that evil spirit of Ike coming out into those causing some distortion. I don't know, but uh, we'll, we'll sort through it. Uh, and the countdown continues to the, uh, 100th episode of the Dave Dynasty Show. We are very fast approaching that milestone. Can you believe it? It's been a man. It's been a long time. Uh, we're we're approaching a year and a half, going on two years here at the show. Uh, but we are just a mere well four more episodes now after today from being in that magical hundred. And like I said, there are some great great episodes coming up. Uh, you'll hear at the end of the show. You'll hear who's on our next uh, podcast, our next episode, and you're going to want to hear it. It's a great great interview. As a matter of fact. It is a first-time podcast interview. Uh, we are bringing you those kind of guests. Uh, have something special lined up for the 100th episode. Should be fun. Should be some good interviews and things there. Um, as you heard at the top of the show, uh, the Midwest wrestling community lost uh, Lois Garland, who back uh, back when I was wrestling, back in those times, uh, yeah, and I say that like an old man, but I am an old man, uh, Lois was an avid supporter uh, of her son Charlie, which is Dude Kind, who was on the show today. Uh, and they were they were at all the shows and everything else, and it really made me think. Uh, 
about how important the fans and the crowds are to shows, right? I mean, sometimes as workers, as people that are inside uh, the wrestling business, you know, sometimes we get a little pretentious, right? And we feel like uh, the fans don't don't have a say, they don't have an opinion, and they do. They have the right uh, to do what they want. And, yeah, I, I'm just like anybody else. Sometimes I go to a show, and, uh, you know, fans, certain fans get annoying, right? And, and some you chuckle at some fans and, and, and what they do. And sometimes the crowd chants uh, get annoying, and, and at least for me, and whatever else. Um, I mean, come on, people. Do we really need every show, every match to have the entire crowd yell, one fall? No, come on, get over it. Jeez Louise. Uh, anyway, um, but at the bottom of the day, it is the crowd that really makes or breaks a show, is it not? I mean, if you are into a match... Uh, and you're at a live event, and it's really you're enjoying the show, enjoying the match, the crowd can take it to that next level, right? If you guys all come together and everybody enjoys it and everybody's carrying on and getting involved and getting invested and feeling that emotion, it really takes it next level. And when you have those avid, avid fans that are there at at, at all of them in their area and supporting people and, and just really being the backbone of this business, that is pretty amazing, right? You can go on social media. You can see these guys, right? There are literally fans who are sharing events, sharing flyers for events, sharing uh, plugs for merchandise, etc. more than the workers themselves. And uh, that's that's a mistake, right? Those it that they are they are they're truly pretty amazing on, on how they uh, how they support. The wrestlers, how they support the companies, how they support the businesses. Some of them, it is an undying support. Uh, you, There are companies that have been open for years and years and years, and there are people that actually plan their lives and their schedules around those events, and that's pretty spectacular. And uh, j- almost, you know, as much as it within the business, when we lose someone in that community and the fan side of the community, uh, you know, it is, uh, it, it is felt. It is uh, an impact. So um, at least on my part, let me let me say that I, I'm appreciative of that uh, and what they do and what the fans do for the show. Uh, and I want to thank you if, if you're one of those fans. And I hope you are. I hope you're a positive fan that supports the product and doesn't go out to put it down and, and be annoying and, and be smarky and, and, and so have what have you. So uh, on to some business uh, before we get to the, the meat of the show. Uh, Pro Wrestling Tees is running their annual summer sale. It has started now. runs through July 6th, Friday, July 6th. If you use the coupon code AMERICA, you get 20% off everything. So this is a great time, fans, to go out and support the Dave Dynasty Show. Buy a shirt, and that includes the new Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. shirt. They're selling pretty well. Uh, go out and buy one of these shirts. Uh, so show your support for the Dave Dynasty Show and the most highly educated man in professional wrestling, Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. and Graham's Gallery. You can go to ProWrestlingTees.com slash the Dave Dynasty and see all of our shirts there. Go buy one. Like I said, you use the promo code AMERICA. You get 20% off now. Can't beat that. Remember, fans, October 27th, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dave Dynasty Show will be out and about making an appearance at Heroes and Legends 11. Uh, We will have a table there. We will be interviewing people. We will be talking to fans. We will be uh, doing lots of recording, lots of meeting and greeting. We'll shake hands. Uh, Probably won't kiss babies because I'm just not into that kind of thing. But, uh... We will have a, you know, hopefully we'll have some cool stuff for you guys to see, to uh, interact with us. Uh, but if you're there, and I hope you are there, it's going to be a great event. You'll come up, say hi, uh, tell us that you're a listener, uh, tell us that you appreciate us, take a picture, post us, tag us, do all that stuff. Uh, it'll be cool. It'll be fun. Uh, you know, we're going to start getting out there more, doing more of these events, and this is a great place to start. Is at Heroes and Legends 11, Fort Wayne, Indiana, October 27th. We're going to take a quick break right now. When we come back, we will have that amazing interview with sexy Sean Casey and big John Murray. So stick around. You've heard him here on the Dave Dynasty Show as a guest and as host of the monthly Graham's Gallery episodes. And now you can hear his stories. You can own a copy of Confessions of a Big Time Wrestler, the audio book from Dr. Jerry Graham Jr., former multi-tag team champion in WWA and owner of Bruiser Bedlam. You can hear all of his encounters with the various wrestlers, places, and promotions he's worked as he tells about his colorful, long, and illustrious career. You can have your own copy for only $25, and that includes shipping and handling. 
It's very simple. Go on Facebook, look up Jerry Jaffe, J-A-F-F-E, send him a private message, and make arrangements to purchase a copy of Confessions of a Big Time Wrestler now. You will not regret this purchase. And welcome back to the Dish Show. I am your co-host, Ike Isaacs, today. We are joined with a very, I guess you could say, motley crew. We have two parts of the five mode. We have sexy Sean Casey and big Tom Murray from Longhorn Steakhouse. I kid you not, this man is at a Longhorn Steakhouse and he's doing an interview with Dave Dynasty. How are we doing tonight, guys? Good, Dave. How are you? Or what's Isaac? up? What's up? Who am I seeing, Isaac or Dave? I, I'm with, I'm Ike. Uh, I, I'm just okay, Dave's. I I'm uh, his sidekick. So he, he got me. Yeah, he, I'm not the brightest. I'm not the brightest. <laughs> Not the brightest for the bulb in the building. <laughs> That's absolutely Too many okay. shots that, I guess. Is going on there. <laughs> That's absolutely okay. Well, we'll jump right in. Um, our first question, as always, is where are you guys from? Uh, from the Queen City, right from Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah, I'm pretty, yeah likewise, Cincinnati. I grew up in a uh, little town, a little subdivision in Cincinnati called Mowood, Ohio. I'm from, actually. Oh, right on. Okay, Cincinnati, Ohio. It's not too far. I live in Muncie, so you guys are hop skipping a jump over in Ohio. Um, so then, uh, another good question for you guys: Did you guys both grow up in Cincinnati, um, or did you guys live somewhere else and then move to Cincinnati? I grew up here. Yeah, I'm originally from Cincinnati, uh, born and raised. Okay, very nice. So then, uh, what what was it like growing up in Cincinnati? Did you guys um, what was the wrestling scene like <laughs> when you were a kid? Oh gosh, uh, our wrestling life. Uh, John and I, we always laugh. We're like, the the greatest thing in the world was Cincinnati Gardens going to see the NWA when Ronnie Ronnie Garver and the Road Warriors and MCA and everybody was there. Uh, it was just. Is that all for you? Oh no, I'm gonna have a steak too. <laughs> you thought he was joking when he said I was a longhorn, didn't you? <laughs> so, so we know John. We know we know John's uh, order when he gets a longhorn. <laughs> yeah, we'll be like, oh, we'll have the regular, right? <laughs> Good God. Yeah, would you finish on about the gardens? I was just telling the stories about some of the guys, uh, uh, some of the great stars that we grew up watching and uh, idolizing as kids and thinking, you know, God, what a dream it would be to one day be in that ring. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I, I tell you, it was the Cincinnati Gardens, and it was uh, probably late 70s, early 80s. And, and, you know, I spent more time running around the... Uh, the concourses and everything when the big matches came up you know the iron sheik and the flair and you know all these guys it was just like wow i mean you start hearing the you start hearing the gradual change from the opening matches you start hearing the crowds start to erupt and the crowd started to erupt when we went back into the arena as a matter of fact Cincinnati Gardens is the first place i ever saw i think uh i think it was the first saw hulk hogan and andre the giant and you know, randy savage and george the animal and to see caliber wrestlers like that and to see, at that time, Cincinnati Gardens was huge to yeah. so an eight-year-old, and ten-year-old. And I'm like, man, someday we're going to be in front of this many people. And little did we know that it really would happen one day. No, absolutely. Yeah, I know. I uh, want to um, uh, see the, the WWF back. And uh, a lot of times they went to a little bit bigger of a venue uh, uh, by the time I was one. And so you can never get close to the guys. And I was always sad to meet these guys. We either one. And then, um, uh, you know, that was like the thing. You know, and they're doing the whole rock and roll thing, and they're wrestlers, <laughs> you know. And then to meet these guys, Cincinnati Gardens, uh, a lot of the boys were so much closer. They came out of the dressing rooms, and sometimes you get your picture with them and all this stuff. And this was just like like a kid in a candy store to finally be standing next to like your dream. Dude, uh, you, was, you remember what was? You'd sneak, you go out of the gardens, and you'd sneak around back to where they were down into the arena. And like some, sometimes they have to walk across the concourse to get to the cars, and they stop and they take their picture. I was like, oh my god, this is so cool! We're actually meet. Like, <laughs> it's like meeting superheroes. Well, that was that was the uh, the great like the the big kept secret. Like nobody knew. Everybody was inside watching the matches, but if you were this big of a fan as we were, you would wander around. Yeah. So eventually somebody would, would stooge it out that, hey, you know, the wrestlers parked so they come out and they get another car or whatever. So we would spend it, it, as much time outside as we would inside during the matches just to get guys. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
so that that must have been pretty cool because obviously you know now when you go to like an independent wrestling show, you know you hang around long enough, eventually you know they got to come out of the locker room afterwards and all that stuff. So, but this is like on a bigger scale too because these are like you said your idols, these people that you've been watching your whole life. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty fantastic. So, okay, Bob, we don't have so was, yeah. okay, we'll do it that way. Oh, did, did his order get messed up? <laughs> no, no, I, did, I wasn't even right now. Uh, like, I, I think she's like, wait a minute, this is um, not the regular order you usually get. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, I'm getting the bar plate. <laughs> Sorry, I'm doing a radio interview, so if I get loud, just kick me in the head. You better be getting the broccoli and picking up coming down there straight and something out. Right. I'm getting a New York strip. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, I'm fat. New York strip's hot. Over to the pretty server there, sitting in my place for a Cincinnati strip. She's hot. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! All right, so she's got the she's got the, she's got the long. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Probably I can already tell. Probably gonna be one of the more interesting interviews I've ever had. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so so eventually, you guys obviously you were fans, um, and then eventually that developed into becoming a part of the sport. So when was that you knew that like this was what you wanted to do with like a career that you wanted this to be your job one day? I'll let Sean answer this one because my my whole story changed over the last few years. And I'll come on. I think I knew it's old. Uh, I think my parents just thought it was something you see on TV, and they're like, "Well, you know, you'll grow out of it." And and uh, uh, even our pops, he was just like, "You know, that's just a pipe dream, or it's something that you're about." Uh, uh, you know, you'll probably play have some kind of white collar or something. That will be some kind of role that you'll take on, as a lot of people do, and things like this. But I just never let go of it, man. I just pushed and pushed, and uh, all the way until 10 years old, and was training with Flying Brian Pillman in his backyard. Mm-hmm. And then. So then, that was when you were like, you, so basically your entire life almost, you'd be like, this is what I want to do. Uh, what about you, John? When was it that you were this like, yeah, this my, is what I want to do? I'll tell you what happened. In 96, late 96, I started training, early 97. No, I'm sorry. You know what? It was late 95, early 96. I started training with the HWA because I'd gone through a divorce. And I was like, okay, you know what? what what's going to happen? You know, I knew that I wanted to do something that involved being around a lot of people had no idea that um, there was wrestling school in the city of Cincinnati. I knew Sean was doing it and everything, but I thought he had already gone somewhere else and made it and then come back. You know what I mean? Sean turned me on to uh, another guy, turned me on to this school that was by um, an an established wrestler from another period. And he started training us, and I I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. But my problem was is I was was a big guy. This is the time that the ECW was becoming big. So I wanted to do hardcore matches. I wanted to do, I wanted to be the Mick Foley of the ECW at six foot eight, and I wanted to. I want people. I thought. I thought all that mattered was giving giving blood and and people and doing those matches. And in reality, trying to tell me you're a big guy. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. You know, there's no reason you should leave your feet. And uh, what happened was I was training one day, and uh, actually wound up hurting my neck. I jams a uh, crack of vertebrae in my neck, and I had to take some time off. But during that time off, I got really gun shy, and I started to pursue a career in music. And I was like, you know, I don't know that I want to do this anymore. You know, this isn't working. I don't like this feeling. So I went and got offered a job with the rap and uh, Metallica and a couple other bands. And I came back and I talked to Sean and I talked to Jackson Breeze and I said, look, this is my opportunity. I don't know which way I want to which way I want to go with this. I, you know, I want wrestling to be my life, but I've always wanted to be in the music world. So what do I do? And they all looked at me, and I mean, almost at the same time, said, "Look, if you have a real opportunity in the music world, take it. Because you never know where it's going to go. You can always come back to this." Right. And I took it, and lo and behold, the next thing you know, I'm on the road, you know, 50 weeks out of the year with different bands, been with Poison from 1999, and. Uh, it's been a nonstop party ever since. And then I, I decided to retire. And when I retired, I looked back up with Sean, went through a little bit of a turmoil. world. And uh, I told him, I said, you know, I wouldn't mind trying to get back in the ring, even at my age. And I, let's be real. At, with my age, at 48 years old, 47, getting ready to be 48, 
there's not going to be a WWE contract in my future anytime soon. You know what I mean? But to back and relive that dream and still be part of it. My life has gone full circle. I started in wrestling with music and came back to wrestling. And to me, that's the way it's supposed to be. You know, if you're not happy doing what you do, what the hell's the point? Absolutely. So that's so pretty incredible. I mean, you have one. You have one that's you know we we have Sean who was like, yeah, this is what I want to do from from the get go, and you you came to us, but eventually you found your way back, and and then Sean was there was like, yeah, let's that's do more it. Like, <laughs> and let me tell you something. I was never not a fan. I mean, I was a huge fan of The Undertaker, and believe me, I followed his entire career, whether I was in music or not. I was still every Monday night I'm planning in front of the TV going, what you gonna do this week? It's all there. But it wasn't my life. It was Sean's life. Sean wanted to be a wrestler from the time he was six years old, five years old. Right. Me, I was going to be. I was going to be famous one way or the other. I didn't know how the hell it was going to happen, but I knew some people didn't know who I was. <laughs> what well, one way or another, right? <laughs> yeah. But as, but as we've done this, it's not really it's cut and dry. Is is just this and then that. I mean, John and I have both done different things. Like John did three seasons of the the biggest show on VH1, The Rock Lover at mm-hmm. Michael and uh, we've done movies now and uh, uh, I did Playgirl twice and uh, even did a little stint with the Chippendales so I mean we have really grown uh, outside of what we set out to do and we have just sort of built around that and oh, hell yeah. wrestling has sort of been our foundation and then we've I believe we've grown uh, above that and with it and then came full circle back to it and bringing everything around it uh, our wrestling life, as we did like the last uh, few nights that we've been with Poison, and uh, John was uh, revisiting with uh, a few of the guys and uh, um, uh, the whole band, which is a second family to him, and uh, introduced me to everybody. And we include that into our wrestling world as we do everything else we do and will continue to do. We'll always still be wrestling is our foundation or our focal point, and five more is our group, and that's our brand. And everything that it comes with that. Right. Absolutely. Let me tell you something. I don't. Even though I was in music and Sean was in wrestling, I don't. I think both of them have continued to feed off each other since we were young. Because you can't go into either world and not experience the same people. For instance, the last two the last two nights we were in Indianapolis and Cincinnati with Poison and Cheap Trick and Pop Evil, and Sean and I walk in the crowd and everybody's throwing up five, throwing up, throwing them up, throwing them down. Everybody's coming up. Oh my God, she's got Sean Casey. And I look at me going, oh my God, big John, what are you, why, you know, you two are together. This, this wrestling thing, it's not just in the ring. It's outside the ring. There's Cody, there's Shauna, there's me, there's David, there's Sean. The five of us are together everywhere we go. And that's what makes this so successful. And that's why it's continuing to grow. It's because it's not just a gimmick in the ring. This is who we are. Right, yeah. We live every day and, and everything that comes to the table, uh, we bring from hundreds of entertainment, uh, be it music and movies and modeling and uh, everything that comes around. It, and, it's, and everybody uh, most wanted, uh, it's not just a group of guys uh, that are just friends and family, but it's a group of guys that something comfortable. And each person says, I bring this part of the group together, and that's what makes it complete. <laughs> you know what? For the entire world's sake, be glad I didn't come home from music and say be a chip and dust answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> So, I don't want to drive Chippendale. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, I would so love actually, to throw that. Actually, kind of on the same. That I was, I was going to say, we can get a hashtag. Uh, Big John Murray Chippendales. <laughs> get that trending on Twitter. <laughs> no way. Uh-oh. So, so kind of on that same track, I mean, we kind of saw your roots. Like you said, you started with wrestling. You, you branched out majorly, and then you came, you know, you came back to it. Um, but actually, I was, I didn't know this. I was actually talking to Dave, and he knew this. He was like, hey, do you know that there's only been two wrestlers to ever appear in, uh, in that magazine, at their, that Playgirl? Only two. You and Shawn Michaels. So, that, that's I, my understanding. Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. <laughs> you know what I was going to say? I was actually just curious, like, how did that come about? Were they just like, hey, dude, come pose? Like, how did that, how did that come about? 
It, you know, it's it's kind of a weird thing because uh, once again, you know, our pops he always they just questioned very conservative, very old school in a lot of decisions because you know it's uh, sort of probably the opposite of his way of thinking because I was <laughs> always like try this, try that. What about this? What about that? He, I remember he said, "Are you that's a good idea for your career?" <laughs> <laughs> I I think it's a great idea, and he gave me that look. (laughs) But, uh, no, you know, a funny little story with that um, is, uh, um, unfortunately, in wrestling, a lot of times they say um, you copied off of this for that. Uh, Too often you hear that. In music, they say you were influenced by. And so I believe I was influenced by lots of different people, but uh, uh, kind of my character is is an interesting character. If you see uh, some of the stuff that's... uh, kind of an 80s rock star, but it really almost like a Shawn, Me- Shawn Michaels meets Brett Michaels uh, meets a John Morrison, uh, and you can see the influences of, like, uh, uh, Billy Gunn and Brian Pillman. But the character, it was funny because I was showing Brett the picture the other day uh, where Brett actually did Playgirl in 92, I believe it was, and then, of course, I think Shawn did it in 94, and then I did it in 97 to 2008. Uh, but uh, it's just interesting, you know, how seeing it come full circle like that, but... Uh, uh, I definitely like to believe it. It uh, it helped more than it ever hurt by doing that, uh, just as Sean did. So it was a long interview. <laughs> John, John's interviews are from the ladies. <laughs> my, my, interview, my interviews are short and sweet. <laughs> to the point, you might say. <laughs> oh, good lord. Uh, like, there we go. Like, 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 like I said, at most I think probably going to be the most interesting podcast we've ever done. Um, buy it by the number of words, ladies. You're going to be <laughs> warmed up. <laughs> oh. buy, our DVD, buy our DVD for real. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, a little redirect. This isn't, like, this isn't like a this is like a Bible school network or something. They're going to be <laughs> their ways, right? No, it's hey, you're good. It's a They're wrestling. Like, oh my god! I want to get Sean. My Sean. What's his name? Michael. Sean <laughs> She's like, is his name Sean Brett Michaels? <laughs> I want to be. I want to meet that Sean Brett guy. <laughs> Sean Brett. <laughs> I was going to say, don't worry. Well, there's definitely going to be a. Uh, e for explicit on this one. <laughs> oh, good God. If we didn't fend somebody, we're not doing our job. Right. <laughs> That's exactly right. So, I guess a kind of a little bit of a redirect. And you kind of mentioned, actually, but you did actually, you trained with uh, Charlie Fulton and Brian Pillman. Um, so, what was that like? What was it like getting to, to train with some of the greats? Uh, you know, it was uh, it was strange because at 17, I'm I'm in Brian's mom's backyard, and uh, there's no ring, and uh, Brian pulls out a, a, just a little small twin mattress out of the garage there because we're gonna train here, and I'm like, there's no ring. He goes, we don't need a ring. Later, I didn't realize this at the time, but years later, I see that Stu Hart's dungeon was really just his basement where he used to just really make these guys earn his respect, and Brian was one of those guys along with Chris Benoit and Davey Boy Smith and uh, all the hearts and the list goes on. Um, and so Brian was just teaching me how he had been taught. And um, unfortunately for me, uh, Brian's uh, training was only short-lived because he was already contracted with WCW. So at that point, uh, and he told me up front, he said, Sean, I can only train you to a certain point, and when I start these dates with WCW, I have to go. So, uh, you know, I, at that, there was no schools or anything uh, in Cincinnati or, or anywhere near Cincinnati uh, during uh, 1988, I believe it was. So uh, I took what I could get and did that. And uh, then it took about four years later until I was 21 years old that um, uh, Charlie Fulton had moved from New Jersey and split with Larry Sharp and had the Monster Factory, uh, which was also Midwest uh, Territorial Wrestling, I think is what it was, um, in um, Marion. And so I was blessed to be able to do that. But even still, that was three and a half hours up one way and three and a half hours back the other way. And another three or four hours in, in Charlie's concrete ring that we trained in. And uh, I was just a happy kid, just glad to be able to get in the business and, and uh, be under the tutelage of, you know, another trainer. Oh, yeah. And, and obviously uh, in the scene recently, I think we have Brian Pillman Jr. Uh, son, who's kind of our Brian Pillman son is kind of becoming a little more relevant. Um, have you gotten to talk to him or if you got to meet him yet? Uh, we know Brian, 
uh, personally, and actually probably almost a year to the day, I think, uh, we did a um, interview on uh, Bill Cunningham's WLW and uh, uh, Cody Hall, myself, and uh, Brian Pillman Jr., and a few other guys went up there, and um, uh, Brian Jr.'s dad, Brian Sr., used to be a, a regular uh, on Bill's show because Bill's a big wrestling fan and loved Brian and thought that Brian was intelligent athletes to come out of uh, Cincinnati and, and all that. So, um, you know, it was just, uh, I think it was an honor for Bill to have his son on the show and five most wanted up there. And so, uh, you yeah, know, we know, uh, but to answer your question, we know Junior very well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's very good. Yeah, he's, he's really good. Guy. Very good. Yeah, you know, I, I, we actually uh, had one of his very, very first interviews uh, when he started wrestling you know, a couple of years, and he was he's such a he's a cool dude. I met him a couple times, so I gotta say, really outstanding guy. But uh, you know, I'm oh, sorry. Go right for it. Go for it. Well, I was gonna say I, I got to give give Brian credit because he uh, it was about four months ago completely blew his leg out, and he could have done what I did. He, you know, when I got hurt, I walked away. You know, he's. He's bound and determined to make this his life, and he's sick into it. Matter of fact, we ran into him up in Circleville, Ohio, and uh, uh, we were kind of, you know, kind of talking, and, and I was, I was impressed with his how much he's, he's getting. Broke. He's doing really well because he's got the great mentality. Of, I'm going to make this work. I'm, I'm ready to get back. I mean, I think he misses it as opposed to, to uh, the way I took it. I was like, all right, you know what? I tried it. I'm hurt. I'm leaving. He's, right. he's he's got in his mind that he's going to make this work. Okay, so it takes a lot to keep that mentality going once you're hurt. And he's opening his mind. Up. He's he's uh, listening uh, uh, to a lot of guys that you know from, from what he's told me. He's taking some and he's he's watching tapes. And he's trying to learn psychology and he's really trying to to grow uh, his mind because when you're when you're on the shelf and you're injured like that, there's not much you can do in ring to you know extend your ability to be better than what it already had reached at that so now you have to let your mind grow and uh, I told about myself I had a broken ankle um, back in 2006 and it was broken three places and I said uh, you know I thought I was just gonna be out maybe six eight weeks turned into a 16 week injury uh, so four miserable months for me and I said you know what I did I tried to watch tapes and I started trying to learn how to do promos better and learn psychology and it's your chance to open your mind up and uh, I believe he's, that's what he's doing now. And, uh, you know, it's a chance for him to slow it down on his feet and so making that mind open up. Yeah, so, uh, and that's actually something, too, that, uh, he, you know, I think I've actually heard a lot of people say is that when you do have an injury, it's, you know, like you said, it's best to kind of um, ease up on the, the physical and open up the mental a lot so that you can kind of not only soak it up mentally but be able to kind of translate that into the physical aspect later. I've definitely heard that a lot. And so many times it gets bypassed because, uh, you know, anybody that's an athlete is physical right. and they believe, okay, I'm more physical and I need to get better fit part. And so they never slow down to learn the rest of it, which is actually probably twice as important than it is the physical. Um, and, you know, not to uh, uh, say that the physical isn't just as important, but it just is so neglected, the, the mental part of it. And so uh, if you use your time wisely when you get injured, it's that chance to learn the things that you wouldn't stop to learn. Right, yeah, exactly. So I guess another little bit of a redirect here. Um, Sean, you usually wrestle, I mean, you've wrestled all over the place. I, I, From what I've seen, I may be oversell or underselling this, but uh, you made some appearances for WCW, WWF, and eventually you signed and worked in Ohio Valley Wrestling. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Uh, that was uh, uh, probably the best time for um, the WWE, probably in the last two decades, uh, in the pool of talent. Uh, the guys that they sent me down there with was uh, John Cena, Randy Orton, uh, Dave Batista, um, gosh, Rob Conway, Nick Densmore, uh, Shelton Benjamin. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And... Um, to date, probably the best pool of talent to come out. Uh, and there's been some great guys since, but just some unbelievable athletes back then. And uh, what an honor that was. And uh, um, just all the matches that I, I was uh, fortunate to be blessed with from the WWE, um, all the way leading up to uh, you know, probably maybe, uh, it's been a little over a year now, I think a year and a half, that uh, WWE released their uh, Brock Lesnar DVD called Eat, Sleep, Conquer, Re- and uh, that was kind of uh, uh, and uh, a pleasant surprise because Brock had went on and how we talked about 
all of our characters growing, Brock went on to grow into doing MMA and went in to be UFC champion for a little while there. And uh, so then thereafter, they decide they're going to release this DVD. So uh, being fortunate enough to be put on it, and we wound up, it's a three-disc set, and we wound up being the first match on the first DVD, and it's a tag match with myself and my old tag partner, Chris Michaels, against uh, Brock and his partner, Shelton Benjamin. So that was kind of a, uh, that's a pleasant surprise, and, and uh, that was one of the matches that they used during my Ohio Valley days. Um, so just uh, really, really, really fun times down there. No, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you've also, you've done some work with TNA, of course. Uh, that's TNA, yes. that's kind of where I think I, I recognize you from, uh, honestly, because I feel like I've heard that part of your career more. Maybe that's just Dave talking to me. <laughs> but uh, so how did that come about? How did the TNA part of your career come about? Well, it was uh, 2002 and uh, – I guess right around the, the, the middle of 2002, I think, uh, and my stint was up with uh, WWE and OVW and uh, started uh, doing a lot of different indie stuff again. And uh, I believe that was the same year that Pro Wrestling Illustrated puts out their top five, and I was uh, 154 out of 500. So um, uh, as I started pursuing some different things, I, I went up to uh, Blue Water Championship Wrestling and, and uh, uh, various things, and and uh, uh, we were just pretty much getting me booked in a lot of different places and went down there and hooked up with uh, um, Jeff Jarrett and Jeremy Borash. And um, back then I had Samantha with me, and they loved Samantha's look. They wanted to use her for the um, – uh, they had the, the uh, cage dancers that they had at the pay-per-views, that girl that would dance on each side of the ring. So uh, she was one of their dancers, and in fact, uh, if the, we would have worked probably a little better contract out with them, uh, she was actually going to be uh, appear on the first calendar as the Cubs, but uh, we couldn't come to an agreement there. And um, so worked a little bit for them and uh, never really established anything solid to uh, evolve into what we were comfortable with. So uh, that was it there. But, you know, years, one, uh, years ago, ECW and, uh, I mean, pretty much every, every major promotion in the nation uh, in the last 26 years of my career uh, I've done and, um, and we're still doing so much fun things. Uh, we talked about how we, our five most wanted brand does so many different things and, and, and touches on so many different, uh, genres of, of different entertainment things. We just, uh, cured, uh, the, uh, California's promotion, the Vendetta Pro, the International Tag Team Championship belts. Uh, Cody Hawk and myself, uh, captured them and, and, uh, Big John was with us and he, uh, was there to, uh, help out, uh, during our thing. Sean Reed was there. And, uh, edible Michael Barnes, and uh, we had a big day out there. But the, the big surprise was, um, uh, <laughs> as the five most wanted always pulls the rabbit out of the hat, so to speak, uh, we were uh, at the finish of the match, and we went through a few things, and uh, we wasn't quite getting the job done. And the surprise attack was Stephen Bonner from the UFC uh, slid in the ring and sort of helped handle some five most wanted business for us. And uh, uh, we left with Stefan and uh, uh, become vic victorious out of that. So, uh, you know, another pleasant surprise, another five most wanted moment. You know, the, the greatest thing about that is, uh, is when you can, when you can pull off a WrestleMania moment in front of all your peers and everybody at these conventions, at these conventions, because I mean, I can tell you, everyone was there. Old school, new school, everyone. When you can pull off a WrestleMania moment, and even those that are smart to your business and been doing it 15, 20 years or more, jump up on their feet and they're like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know you did right. Right. Absolutely. Um, and actually kind of segues into a very important question. Um, as we mentioned in the beginning and as you guys have been talking about, um, you have a fantastic group, the five most wanted. Um and I'm curious, how how did the Five Most Wanted? How did that start? Where where what are the origin story for Five Most Wanted? As far as how did it start? Well, how did it start? Uh, you know, <laughs> it's a funny story. It was it, it's almost the uh, uh, the Motley Crue song when we started this band. All we needed needed was a laugh. Years gone by, and I'd say we kicked some ass. You know, it's. We kind of just were a group of guys hanging out, having fun, and, uh, you know, as we just sort of, uh, what was the, the 50s they had, the Rat Pack, I think was just a group of guys that were just all friends, 
and they all just kind of ran around, but they were from the uh, the movie industry. Am I correct on that? No, movies and music. It was uh, it was Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. and all those guys. Okay, so just you know you had that something like that. So that's kind of how the every, flashbulb every one was. brought a different every one of them brought a different aspect to the whole thing. Just like just like the five most wanted. One was in movies. One was a, a, a swooner. I was playing Sinatra, Dean Martin. They, they, you know, they were the casinos, the uh, swooners. Uh, Sammy Davis Jr. was a comedian. Everyone brought something different to the table, just like the five most wanted. And the and the original five uh, was no different. We had uh, uh, myself who had done uh, Playgirl and had been, you know, WWE and did all these different things uh, that I brought to the table. And we had Cody Hawk, who was uh, straight from the HWA and. Uh, was uh, during the contract days for HWA and was the top babyface in uh, in HWA at the time and had wrestled and been you know all around the world uh, and Samantha had already done the TNA thing that we talked about and uh, looked as good as any WWE diva and um, uh, Josh Rafferty was on the first season of Ultimate Fighter and uh, was one of the original UFC guys uh, all came to the table and then the icing on the cake would be Rosie would be. Uh, the the fifth member of the group, which uh, was is the cousin of The Rock, and you know everybody knew Rosie and it wrestled around the world. And he was uh, uh, wrestled as uh, Chemo uh, because uh, I believe WWE had owned the name and he couldn't use that, uh, so he was Chemo when he was with us. But you know it gets no better than uh, Cody and uh, Josh and Samantha and Rosie. I mean that's you know myself. It, it was. What a what an original group! But it all just started out with just a lot of friends having fun, having some laughs, and saying, "What if we did this?" And we were just being ourselves. What we're already doing, but let's put it on TV. So, just a, and that was the that was the go ahead. That was the foundation of the group, and and uh, just like you know, as bands do, sometimes uh, some original members might go one direction and some go another. Uh, we have searched out and found. Uh, you know, what we believe to be a solid uh, core group again where each member brings something to the table and uh, you wouldn't, if you in the five most wanted unless you could uh, pull your weight and each five most wanted member does and uh, uh, that's what makes it so solid and what makes us uh, fucking proud to have uh, uh, John with us and everybody else uh, because each person, you take them out of the group and you go, well, what are they? You go, I don't know. Google them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, and, and you know, that's actually, like, like I said in the beginning, we have ourselves a little motley crew, and, you know, that's exactly, that sounds like exactly what it is. Just a, a like you said, my friends doing what they do, and they do it well. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank so, you very much. So, you know, right now, I mean, I, I feel like, the five most wanted is actually a really good example of this, but independent wrestling it produces so many great things, and I think that the five most wanted is a very a, a very nice product of a bunch of wrestlers coming together and just working together really well. So both of you are part of independent wrestling, um, and right now independent wrestling is just insane. I mean, it's probably hotter than it's ever been, but. In your guys' opinions, what do you think is the best and the worst part about independent wrestling? Go ahead. You go first, John, because I can tell you right now what I think. Uh, the best and the worst parts. Um, the best part of independent wrestling is I believe it gives the fans a chance to um, meet a rise that they wouldn't normally get to meet. Uh, I know that... Um, as they've sold uh, um, WWE and the product that they give now, uh, understand they have a lot of people that they have to put smiles on faces. So um, I believe that they're limited on, you know, how much they can do because, uh, you know, it's always most important to keep the sponsors happy uh, first and foremost. But unfortunately, um, I believe it hurts the product. Uh, but with independent wrestling, it gives fans a chance to see, um, something's not being held back and, and uh, something where people can um, uh, see more cre- creativity of characters and meet those uh, 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 wrestlers that they are seeing that they're idolizing that. Uh, uh, the only thing that I, I don't like about the indie scene is a lot of times uh, in the indie world, um, because it's become popular, there's a lot of justification on guys 
uh, looking just like indie guys. And, and the guys that, that John and myself and everybody grew up on, we grew up that uh, all these guys, if you were at a grocery store, you were at the airport, you were anywhere you were at, you knew they were wrestlers. There was no question about it. You're like, I don't know who that guy is, but that guy's a pro wrestler. And now I just, you know, I've heard it so many different times, and I believe it myself. You can see a guy, and if he wasn't in his in his gear, then he just might look like the guy at the at the gas station up the street you just got gas from, and you wouldn't even know if somebody didn't tell you. Right. And and I think that hurts it because uh, they. My understanding is they they like to make some of the uh, the people that uh, follow wrestling these days. And the people that are, are the main fans, they say, okay, well, people can relate to these type of characters. And I understand that. But at the same time, um, those same people don't buy comic books for people like regular people. They buy stuff for larger-than-life characters. And I, I believe, in the end, that's really what people, no matter what you're into, or no matter what, uh, be it the movies or wrestling or rock and roll or whatever, you have to have something larger than life because that's, what creates the excitements. Right. So yeah, then, the Undertaker was not the Undertaker because he looked like five foot one and, you know, <laughs> blended exactly. in with the cracks. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> that's why when his music came on, the lights hit, you know, people would get goosebumps. That's the electricity that's, that's missing uh, that was in the Attitude Era. Uh, just, you know, as a fan myself, even after being in the business that long in the late 90s, uh, I still got goosebumps when guys would come to the ring because you knew it was good, and I believe that's the missing element. Right. No, absolutely. I, I definitely agree. I feel like you know the the sport very saturated, like with like you said, and obviously no disrespect for people like this, but you know Joe Schmo from down the street can just you know slap on some tights and suddenly they're a wrestler. You know, it's kind of missing Bingo. that excitement. You know, but. Uh, it, well, you know, and here, here's here's something else to consider. When I was growing up, my when I was in high school, my thing in high school and grade school, my thing was to play football. I wanted to play football. I was being groomed to play football, and and my pops kept telling me, you know, son, one out of a hundred make it. That, that's it. One out of a hundred is going to make it into the pros. Now, the problem is, is ninety nine out of a hundred can walk in and say that they're a professional wrestler. Not that I am. Not that I'm any better, not that I'm any worse, but, you know, anybody can in, go through a little bit of training, and now they're a professional wrestler. And the problem is, is they don't know shit from Shinola about what it takes to be a real wrestler. You look at people like, like Shane Douglas. You look at people like Bobby Fulton. You look at people like Marty Gennetti. Those are wrestlers. They know the psychology. They know the etiquette. They know how to create a match. They know how to work a match. They know how to work the crowd. I watched Sean and Cody with Bob Orton and Bobby Fulton wrestle for eight minutes, and they tied up three times. That's how involved the, the – and, and they had the crowd on their feet because of the psychology and the execution of proper moves. Right. Do you, do you, does that make sense? Yeah. Nowadays, if you, can do a, if you can do a hurricane rod or a superplex, you're, you're a professional wrestler. And this is going to be this is going to be the fall of it because they're going to have a generation of cripples because they don't know what the hell they're doing. And Shane, you know, I, I sat there and listened to Bobby Fulton and Shane Douglas. You know what? All this flipping and flying and all don't do shit if you don't know what the hell you're doing because you can't. When when you got a crowd sitting there and half of them are on there looking at their phones, going, "Oh, I wonder what's going on on Facebook," and there's a match going on, you're not doing a damn thing for them. You know what I mean? But Absolutely. you put someone like, like, and Sean learned from Al Snow. And you watch, if you watch movements, and you watch, if you watch Al Snow's movements and you watch psychology, you'll be able to tell who, who learned from some of the older people that were successful. You'll see those mannerisms. You'll see those, those little twerks and those little things that it's like, huh, I know where he got that. Well, wow, that, he did the exact thing. And there's a reason for that. It's because it works. And these kids today... And I'll be honest with you, I was that kid 20 years ago. I didn't want to listen to anybody, and that's how I got hurt. Right. But the kids today come up, and they, they're watching all this stuff in the backyard and independent stuff, and they think that, you know, 14 super kicks <laughs> makes a match. It's great. Well, which one Which one kicked my ass? Which right. one was the one that, was, that hurt me so much? It should be one, but there's so much hold up that, you know, it's like, bang! Like, holy shit, how's he going to get up from that? Right. 
Yeah, and, and you shouldn't be able to. Otherwise, what's the next nine mean? <laughs> I mean? That's like that's like me giving somebody that's like me giving somebody a buckle bomb. I give them a buckle bomb or, or a jackknife power bomb, and they get up and they're like they don't and they're like, oh hey, guess what? That didn't hurt. Well, guess what? I'm not doing again. Right. <laughs> I'm not doing it the nice way. That's not what I'm. That's what I'm doing. I'm not doing it the nice way. Next time you're doing it on the cement. <laughs> and it's going to be a hell of a lot. And it was in the ring. <laughs> right. Well, and the sad part is, it's sad part is that for somebody to even be able to get up from that is dumb because it does hurt. And so you're only telling everybody, you're telling yourself it doesn't hurt, but it did. <laughs> why, why this idiot just get up? I know it hurt. <laughs> Jesus, what I was learning, what I was, when I was being given them and I was learning, I don't know how many times I thought my ribs were broken. I knocked the wind out of me. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to breathe for a week. <laughs> it hurts. And you're giving me young kid on the hey, egg. I'm not going to. Uh, well, we all know it. I'm not going to send him get up and chase me around the ring. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to chase you. Guess where I'm chasing you? Straight to the ER because we're doing this outside the ring now. Right. <laughs> be like, prepare, be prepared to get dropped. <laughs> <laughs> one way or the other, one way or the other, you're going home with broken ribs. Right. <laughs> Apparently, that didn't hurt enough. Let me right. try again. <laughs> I promise you, that didn't hurt that bad, and I know it did. I promise it'll hurt ten times worse. That takes me down. That takes me down to Owens. Old, uh, old, envious has a little ass whooping coming in about eight weeks when I heal up. <laughs> oh, you hear that, Lincoln? Tell <laughs> me oh, for you. I've my damn repair my rotator cuff. I'm coming back into hardcore. Yeah, John's getting ready to go to surgery. It was it Thursday? It's supposed to be Thursday. If everything works out, I gotta take uh they wanna do that they did that pre uh a uh what do they call it? Pre anesthesia like surgical checkup. They wanna do an EKG on me first to make sure that you know, everything's okay, so it might delay it for a couple of days or a week. So it's fine with me. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> no hurry to be under the knife, right? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think anybody would be in a in a perfect hurry to get under a knife. Personally, I wouldn't be. I'd be like, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm like, I'll, take a, I'll, I'll take a shot. Yeah, whatever. Avoid it all at cost. Right. <laughs> at all cost. <laughs> Believe so, me, I'm under enough at home. I don't need to be under a knife. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the doghouse enough. I don't need to be in the workshop. Like it's like a Mexican street fight over this place. <laughs> yeah, guns, knives, crowbars, whatever. Lord. Like, like, like I said, I think I said this multiple times, most interesting interview of the Dave Dynasty show. Oh, God. <laughs> so, I, we aim to, we aim to play. Right. <laughs> you, you, you aimed yeah. something, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, and honestly, that that whole little thing right there, I guess, just a kind of a quick comment. Um, that's a lot of good advice, I feel like, because if you really break down what you guys are saying, I mean, it's really good advice, you know. And I I really do agree. I think actually, me and Dave are talking about this, uh, how you can be in a match and there will be twelve false finishes, you know, twelve you know super kicks or twelve power bombs and. You know, and, and it just doesn't have any effect. You're just looking at your phone like, okay, what what's next? And yeah, look, yeah. people don't people don't get this. And, and I, I'll uh, throw a little two cents in here uh, uh, and let you finish up. I may cut you off, but uh, from time to time I do seminars, and, and one of the questions I ask uh, the kids there, what do you think made ECW so popular? And they go, the flaming tables and the hardcore stuff and this and that. And I go. And you think that drew money? Do you think that's really, like, why everybody watched? And they're like, yeah. I said, don't get me wrong. That was a big portion. But do you know what reeled them in? Do you know what was the hook on everything? That was, this is what the slam dunk, and this is what kept them captivated? It was the psychology. Because they think that Paul Heyman was uh, so innovative that he did all this crazy stuff with all the wrestlers. And Paul Heyman was like... The, the uh, it factor of taking it to extreme, and that's where everybody watched it, and nobody understood that uh, that what made all that good. And I wish everybody could talk to Shane Douglas to hear this, so they could hear from the horse's mouth. But what made it good was the psychology behind all the extreme things they did, and yep. that is why everybody stopped and went, "I love this product." Right. Uh, there was never a more heartfelt moment felt moment than uh, when. Uh, uh, man had been chasing Raven trying to get his son back. They'd been brainwashed. And when he finally got to his kid, he hit the ring, 
and uh, and he, he saves his boy, and he was like, Daddy's here, and he's like, you're not my dad, Raven is. And then people were like, oh, my God, he brain, Raven brainwashed Sandman's son now. And that yeah. kind of stuff is the money <laughs> that was behind that product. Right. And, and you know, it's also... Oh, God. <laughs> you know, here's the, here's the killer thing. It's... By the time by the time ECW came around, Vince had already broken KFA. Okay, right. everybody knew. Oh yeah, you're training, you're doing this. It's it's a body of hurts, whatever you want to call it. But when you can take ten thousand, twenty thousand, fifteen thousand people, put them in arena, and you got Devon and Bubba Ray, and at the exact moment that you watch a show and you hear fifteen, twenty thousand people go, get the tables. It works because. How the hell else would they do us a phone? It's not a script. It's we're building, we're building, we're building. Hit the button. And they hit the button and you hear, get the tables. It's like, nice. How did everybody know to say that all at once? <laughs> it's the psychology of it. Right. And it's, it's a psychology. Kevin knows this better than anybody from the music industry. A, a good front man. And we'll go back to yep. uh, his guy, Brett Michaels. A good front man knows when to tell the people to put their lighters up, when to tell them to put them down, when to tell them to put their hands up, and, and actually get them to do it. It's one thing to ask them to do it, nobody does. It's another thing when this guy leads the crowd and has them in the palm of his hand. It's the psychology of music. It's the psychology we're talking about of wrestling. It's the psychology in everything that you're trying to do to make people realize that they're emotionally attached to something and they're having the time of their life. Bingo. That's the, that's the key. If you can pull them in and they become part of it, they take ownership in it, and that's why it works. Wow. Yeah, and I definitely agree. And, you know, and it's funny you bring up ECW and all this stuff. And, like, and it's like I feel like that level of uh, psychology and that level of convincing, you, you really can't do anymore. There's so much limitation in the WWE. There's so much limitation in these big products. And that's why I think independent wrestling is so amazing is you can still do these – outlish things but still make sense of them you know but you know the WWE won't do it anymore because they're a family friendly product well that's that you see there's the, there's the the biggest mistake in professional wrestling is the sponsors control the storylines now right. believe me there's a reason there's the reason the independents are, are so big and so are so gaining such popularity and momentum and the simple fact is that I don't have some dickhead sitting in an office with a tie going <laughs> Hey, listen, Mary Sue got upset because you, you bled last week. Uh, great. Tell Mary Sue to go down the street to, uh, to uh, Goody Two Shoes Wrestling because here we do it real. Right. Yeah, see, often, uh, and, and I understand when there's big money involved, you do what you have to do, but, but it, it becomes a commercial or an infomercial for everything that they're trying to push, which used to be their pay-per-views and their T-shirts and all the different things that they're trying to push. And, uh, and then get their commercials in for, you know, wherever the, the sponsors are paying. And, it, you know, that's where the product is just the time filler for an infomercial of what you're trying to, to build around it. Um, and that's what's making independent wrestling good where people go, we're tired of the infomercial. We want to see where uh, things are, you know, more creativity in what's being done. Hell, it got, it got to the point where I missed half a wall on Monday nights because, the subway commercials made me so hungry I had to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing they were. They wonder why ratings went down. They wonder why ratings went down because half their fans had to go get to eat at Subway. <laughs> I was gonna make the joke. At least, at least there wasn't any Longhorn Steakhouse commercials, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm already out of there. I'm already on my way home. Right. Maybe, like, maybe Longhorn, though, we got a cheap plug there. Can we give them those uh, free vouchers now? Exactly. <laughs> right. Hey, if Longhorn was a sponsor, me, I'll, I'll push their product all day, dude. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe some broccoli or something. God. So, I mean, honestly, you guys have you guys have appeared. I mean, we we kind of talked a little bit about where you guys have kind of wrestled, some of your experiences, and you know your kind of your insights on wrestling. And you guys have kind of appeared all over the place. Like you said, you guys were you, you were in Ohio, you were in California, you were everywhere. So, over your careers, what would you guys say your top highlight is oh, so far? The top highlight so far? 
Uh, gosh, I don't even know uh, uh, where to end and where to begin. I mean, uh, probably just the top highlight uh, for me is just the honor of even the very first time ever being uh, asked to, to go to the WWF and uh, wrestle for them. Uh, that was a, a dream I had that, of course, everybody wants to fulfill their dreams, but it's one thing to be fortunate enough that you were trained and you got to do pro wrestling, but to ever just even have one time, one opportunity to stand in the ring, that in itself is probably one of the biggest highlights of dream come true. Um, that alone, um, that I feel blessed that I've, I've done. Uh, but there's so many other things uh, that have happened along the way that uh, I could go on and on and on, but uh, just that opportunity, just that one thing alone, I would say is the, is the number one thing to me. Wow. And yeah, you know, a lot of people can't say that they've ever gotten to, you know, step on the, the biggest of them all, I guess you could say, which would be the WWE, <laughs> WWE. Um, and, and, you know, that is a pretty good highlight because that's one of those things where it's like, like you said, you just, you were in, you, you, they're like, hey, come wrestle. And it's like, that's like a pretty good opportunity. That's a pretty good compliment, you know. Um, well, you know, I'll I tell you, there was something else we were, we were joking about the other day, uh, myself. And, uh, and I guess here, here's something else. I, I'll answer this because I think John will, uh, uh, get a kick out of this one. Here's something when we talk about, uh, uh, our careers and, and we'll say his career in music and my career in wrestling is to, in Google our name and then put what we did. So if you put Big John Poison <laughs> or Big John Brett Michaels, or if you put Sean Casey WWE and you Google that and have stuff come up, uh, it's just an amazing feeling. Uh, and we, that's our joke. That's, you know, who are you? Google us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know it, it's, it, it's, it's horrible that we think like that, but that's today's world. Right. I'm serious. You, you, if you if you got a Wikipedia or an IMDb, or if you're on, if you can Google your name and something pops up, in today's world, you've made it. People believe you're somebody then, right? Like people it, it use one of smartphones, then you're some. Yeah, it <laughs> used to be. Hey, if you get a paycheck, and it doesn't even have to be. If you get paid by the WWE at that time, WWF. If you go and you follow your dreams and you get a paycheck, I don't care how big or how little. I'll never, I'll never forget here. You get a paycheck, it's a real job. It's a real job. It doesn't matter. You're getting paid for it. That's a job. you got to be on Wikipedia, Google, or IMDb to have made it. Right. Right. And, it, and, it's, and it's funny. You guys talk about Googling I yourselves. You got, I, think you rolled, I think you rolled over the cat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. The, the, the podcast was a little bit longer than what I thought, and... Uh, uh, we got a little mascot, uh, our dog Amiga, uh, which is this uh, Samoy that looks like a husky. She's been over here just pulling away at me. I'm like, all right, well, it's been another 50 minutes. I have to clean something up. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, God. Oh, yeah. yeah, we don't want that to happen. <laughs> that, that, was, that was the door. Right. <laughs> Walking out the front. <laughs> you know, it's funny. You were talking about Googling yourselves, but, you know, I, I Googled both of you before. Because I'd see, actually I'd seen you guys wrestle in Circleville. Hey, 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 I didn't know it was that kind of party. Right. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, cause I obviously like I said I seen you guys uh, and because I saw you guys in Circleville uh, a couple weekends ago at Bobby Fulton's last show. Um, but I also googled you and that's when Dave was like, yeah, he was in Playboy, Playgirl. Careful what you Google. <laughs> so. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll be careful. You're like, you're like, I was just looking for the wrestling pictures, not the modeling ones. <laughs> just there, Nas. Just there. Just there. Right? <laughs> uh, well, I pretty much we're almost winded down here, you know. First, I want to thank you both for uh, coming on the show. Uh, and for those who don't know, we had actually had this scheduled uh, actually like last week. But um, fun fact, I, I was caught in a storm and my power went out. But funny enough, that same day, our friends here went to a concert. So it, it worked out perfectly. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. And, and, you know, and it's awesome because we got John to come on here too, which is fantastic. So I want to thank you both first for coming on here. It's been an absolute honor and a pleasure. Uh, but before I let you guys go, I'm sure you guys have some social medias where people can follow you and uh, keep up with the five most wanted. So if you want to go ahead and pit for us. Absolutely. 
That's what, you, you know what? You can go to uh, Five Most Wanted on Five MW on um, Facebook, or you can go to Sean Casey or uh, um, John Murray. That's my you know. Forget the big. Just go to John Murray. Right. We we self promote. We self promote the Five Most Wanted because, like you said, that is who we are. Um, you can go. You know, what's uh, what's Cody's school? Is it Hawk Army or? I think it's Hawk Army is uh, is uh, or it's like uh, Cody Dash Hawk dot net. I think is what yeah the, his actual website where you can buy some of his indie merchandise and some Five Most Wanted merchandise as well, um, and uh, oh um, some various different things. What's what's the big T-shirt uh, company that's uh, what, T-shirt? Pro Wrestling Tees. Pro Wrestling Tees. Yeah, I know he's got some stuff on there. Uh, we got the Five also... Most Wanted shirt on there. It's actually drawing some controversy. Believe it or not, because people are saying that we're promoting gang violence because our shirt resembles uh, the NWA's greatest hits. I don't know where they got that idea, but <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're not a gang; violence. we're a club. <laughs> we're, 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 we're promoting violence coming to a town near you. <laughs> Keep saying we're promoting gang violence. I was like, "What the hell is a gang? We're a club. You want to join? Come on!" Uh, uh, somebody must have heard a couple of our. Hotel room uh, beds going off there for most violence. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's when you tell them, be like, "Hey, look, we're we're good church going folk. We have a Sunday school group and everything." <laughs> yeah, we got a five most one that Bible group. Well, I'm waiting for the call from Ice Cube to say, "Hey, we don't like your shirt." I'm like, "Great, I don't like your music." <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, Ice Tray. <laughs> like i said most interesting podcast interview i've ever done uh so you guys heard it here you know where to go find them uh, go buy their shirt let's spread the controversy uh <laughs> let's, yeah. let's make that real <laughs> but again i i want to thank oh, you no, both. Dude, that, that's the real that's no we're actually, we, Shauna actually got an email from somebody that says, don't you feel bad because you're promoting gang violence and inner city youth to be violent by promoting. And I was like, are you out of your freaking mind? <laughs> like, I'm like, it, 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 it baffles me how stupid people really are. You, you know, it, it does surprise me, honestly, that someone sent you that email. I feel like people are so quick just to take something the wrong way. It's not even funny. But hey, I don't care. All all press is good press, right? And if, if the press wants to pick up on it, and they want to. They want to. You know, if there's controversy, listen. One of the biggest rock. I can talk about rock and roll all day long. And one of the biggest rock and roll bands, Kiss, was created off of controversy. So if they want to say that we're controversial and we 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 break the barriers and everything else, that's great. That's what the five most wanted is about. Because I don't. We don't know how barriers are. We're going to come into your ring. We're going to come into your arena, and we're going to take over one by one. City by city, it's going to become our territory. Absolutely. I'm going to have to go look at this shirt now because I'm curious. But uh, <laughs> You ready? Go, go get you one and create some controversy in your neighborhood. <laughs> right. <laughs> Start a gang in my neighborhood. <laughs> uh, Y'all would. <laughs> right. Oh, God. Well, you know, thank you guys. Honestly, thank you guys for coming on here. I mean, look, we, we had John in a longhorn. Let's chatting uh, chatting us up while he's eating his dinner and you know we got sean over here taking his dog out so but thank you both for spending the time i know we've been on here for a minute but uh, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure guys um but everybody go Brother, follow this them. Is awesome thank you no not a problem everybody go follow them on all the social medias go buy some shirts I, like they said create create your own five must want a gang and um as always support independent wrestling because when you support independent wrestling you are supporting real wrestling um, but thanks again, Please guys. Do check, check out. Go ahead. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just want to send a, a shout out to, uh, uh, for all the members of Five Most Wanted. So you have a chance to see everybody uh, go out, check out uh, Cody Hawk, check out Shauna Reed, check out uh, Eric Smalls uh, and Edible Michael Barnes. Both were uh, our northern version of the Five Most Wanted yeah. uh, both at WrestleMania uh, this year. Um, check out uh, David J, uh, the Agent of the Stars. Um, also, uh, check out myself, Sean Casey, uh, Big John Murray, and uh, uh, check out Sean Reed. Now, I think hey, are, you allowed, are you allowed to uh, release anything about the movies yet? Uh, I believe it's okay at this point. Yeah. Okay. Make sure you uh, make sure if you go out and see the part, 
uh, it's a new movie uh, that was just filmed here uh, with Emilio Estevez as the re- director. It was filmed in Cincinnati. Check out the public. You might be surprised who you see in there. There's uh, the cameos from the Five Most Wanted. There's going to be uh, there's going to be some cameos and some some serious roles in an, an up and coming movie called Donnie Brook. Just keep your eyes open because we got a lot of things. Like we said, we're not just wrestling. We're expanding. This brand is growing, and we're going to be everywhere. Everywhere you turn around. It, I want to make it like another one that came back in the 80s, you know, that, uh, are you ready? We're movie music and more. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> we are going to take all, we want, our goal is to take over as much as we can as far as the end of business. We're going to hit every market and see what works. Hey, that's absolutely okay. That that's that's even better for everybody. I didn't know you guys were in some movies, so I'm gonna have to now I'm gonna have to go Google that now. <laughs> go find yep. some movies you guys are in. <laughs> oh dang. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's, the the roles keep coming, and every time that they every time you see calls back, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it won't be long before you see a Sean or you see a Cody, and and hopefully co-star roles are. You know, look at this. WWE has WWE pictures. You know, there's all these other networks that are filming in Cincinnati, and a lot of things are, are happening that, you know, we're trying to get our, our, our iron in the fire, if you will. And with the help of David J, he, he's a mastermind when it comes to Hollywood, and uh, he's making some things happen. So don't be surprised what you see in the future. And that's, that's for real, for real. That's not that's not a work. Not and we're, we're all over the place. Like we mentioned, uh, uh, you know, we have... Uh, our five most wanted is a core group for different chapters in different places. We even uh, out on the West Coast with a five most wanted uh, West Coast chapter. Uh, we have uh, Billy Kidd who is uh, going to be uh, appearing in uh, Netflix Fuller House, which is the version of Full House uh, yeah. with John Stamos right. and uh, Richie Slade's out there and uh, Noe Vega. And we got just a select of different people. Uh, Josh Rafferty, we mentioned, is uh, down in uh, Tampa right now and our southern version with the five most wanted crew down there. Uh, and he trains Dave Batista and Finn Bounds, our different uh, ex-WWE guys and, and friends of the five. Uh, so a lot going on, and you definitely want to uh, check out everybody's social media and stay tuned for everything because there's always big, big, big things happening. Whatever happened to you? Let's jump right into it. So... First question, as always, tell us how you guys. Oh, uh, I was 15, and one of my friends, Brad Lehman, I in high school. Jordan, he was really starting to pick up steam, get a name for himself, and uh, I just kept hammering on it in my head and hammering, 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 and it's something I want to do. So let's do it to a couple. This and I love them. Wow, okay. So then I would assume then you were a fan prior to training. Then who are some of your favorite like, up and whatnot? I would imagine uh, Mick maybe one of them, right? Yeah, uh, Mick Foley, Funk, the Four Horsemen, um, Albert Hogan, you know, all like I love Hacksaw Jim Duggan, he was a guy. So when wrestling off, there's a moment where you start, you know, you start becoming a fan, you start training as a wrestler. Uh, you mentioned Brad Lemon, we just pretend the other guy. Um, so then let me tell you, when you start training, um, was it was it what you thought it would when you started training to become a wrestler? I, uh, I was expecting more fun, and then I realized it's work, and I'm sore, you know. Uh, we all know the aspect about the business, and we don't realize how sore you get, how quick it, you know, uh, when you're first starting out. The day one bumps, and you're home after a week. It's, it was definitely that uh, eye-opener, but, I mean, once you really get in it and start working, the passion, I mean, it just grows. It's so, it you might work hard, but it's so much fun. Absolutely. It's one of those where, oh, yeah, it hurts a lot, but <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. I saw so much fun. And just right down here with uh, Brad, uh, we were in Columbus, and we'd drive down to North Vernon, this, and 30-minute drive, you know, we talk about things that, like, you know, things that we would go in this ad. It was just, it was just as fun as getting in the ring and working with him. So then it kind of, um, you start working different places. Where all did you work, and what were some of your uh, favorite people to work with? Um, oh, my all-time favorite would be uh, in, in the older Hoosier Pro, Brad Lehman, um, Chris Halliburton when he was there. Uh, all those guys that when I broke into uh, I mainly worked Columbus and North Vernon, but I've been up to Indy a few times. We went up to Gas City a few times. Uh, 
but I'm in the north of Vernon, getting that fairly close to home. Um, I got to see everything that I really liked and really worked with and really got comfortable with. So what was it like working for Jerry Wilson? I, You know, obviously I'm per- pretty close with Dave Dynasty, so he's told me some stories, but what was that like? Um, He was a good guy. Uh, I never had any major issues. There was, there was a few. There was a thing out at one point, and there was heat between a bunch of people, but I wanted to stay out of that and just work. So me and him always had, like, a mutual respect, and I respect with everybody, and sometimes that, that works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, some people feel betrayed. You know, you can't keep some friendships, but I tried to keep friendships with everybody. No, absolutely. That's a, that's a good mentality to have, keep the drama out. <laughs> so, Tell us about um, the dude kind gimmick and how it came to be. I, I think I have a guess on how it came to be, but I, but I want to agree. <laughs> um, I, that was actually Rob that came up with that. Um, I was kicking around ideas and I was stalemate kind of in my head where I wanted to go, and he was like, "Well, you know, try this." And I tried it. I enjoyed it, and we we kept it for a while. I like dude. He was he was uncared. So the name itself, it's dude kind. Now I'm gonna take a, a wild guess. Was it supposed to be a mashup of dude man? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> just, just make. Sure I, that's why I said I, I imagine Mick Foley is one of your favorite wrestlers. <laughs> but uh, very cool. I, actually, I was talking to Dave and I was like, man, I said I I I could be totally you know off kelter here, but is that what that is? And he's like, so. Um. So, uh, kind of another one of the things with uh. With your, I know a bit of dumb research, and I think I've actually seen you in the ring once or twice when I was way, way younger. Um, did back when did mind you, caliber in the loose screws. Uh, tell us about. This has been one of my best friends for forever, uh, and me and him and his are uh, together. We had fun together. We, you know, have us together. That was one of the highlights of life so far. Um, uh, and his brother was uh, real influential to me. Um, Chris's passion for the business, passion for the business. I, you know, I guess, you know, I, that was some of the best time of my life. Just some, some you know, that, I mean, that really get, you know, uh, creative. just flowing, just having those guys there with me, talking, talking everything through what would be, you know, good to do. So, yeah, it was one of the, the best parts of it. And, you know, uh, with with being, you know, in a group like that, um, did you prefer team wrestling or did you prefer skills? What was, what are your thoughts on that? Um, the good thing about, um, work with I worked with if if I you know I I preferred or well I didn't really prefer anything. Um, if the promoter wanted us to do something together, we would do it together. If he was like, okay, well we got him to do this, so you can just do this. You know, I I didn't in the ring. Um, personally, I I I did have a preference. I, you know, if I just got to get in there and have fun minutes, ten minutes, good. Right. Yeah. You're just like I'll take, I'll take whatever. People, uh, I think they get choose and they they lose it on. So one of the things too about when you work is that you, you do work, look back fondest memories overall about wrestling and looking back on your life. Honestly, it's in the car, man. Uh, that having having a guy that you would you would seven minutes that was for me. Having that secondary family, you know, and even if when the business it guys and buddies get and you're kind of good to each other and that, that right there, that brotherhood, that was absolutely the part. No, absolutely. I think I've heard that a lot from people. Having that, you know, camaraderie, having that, you know, uh, those relationships with people, those friendships. Not something you get every day. But it is something that I would look and be like, wow, that was good. And I had our fun, too. There was, there was times where, you know, we'd set three hours before anybody would show up. And we would get those old comebacks. I know that song would be, and then, oh, we got to make that fun. You know what say? If you're not doing it right. <laughs> it looks like you're on with wrestling. Um... Do you still do you still get in the ring behind you right now? That's that's definitely behind me. Um, I I had I had so much fun, but uh, that's something that that's younger people, I guess. <laughs> no, I understand. Now that you're out of it, what are you up to currently? What is it that keeps a dude kind of busy these days? Oh, mainly one. I work work insane hours. That's number two. Um, and, and then I guess kind of a, a little more on side question. Um, fun fact, Dave Nasty used to have a comic store. It was called uh, Psychic Comics. I used to work there. And I've actually, I know you from Psychic Comics. Are still, uh, still a comic book fan. Yes. Yes. I just uh, just picked up Comic Thousand. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I was trying to get all the, I, I got the uh, variant covers. 
and my hands on a few more, but they're starting to get a little pricey. But the, the variant covers always get pricey. Um, for for those people out there that have no idea what comics are. It's fine. Just zone out for a second. But um, <laughs> I remember there was the uh, there was the issue of oh god, Batman Incorporated was the last issue where Damian Wayne dies. Uh, spoiler. Oh, okay. um, I remember I was trying to get my hand covers for that a, a, a couple of years back, and man, those things are so expensive. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. and good price and so yeah. So sorry for people who don't read comic books. That one that one's a personal thing. <laughs> I, I I really like that issue too. That was. I, I honestly, like, I so walked up that you and I was, like, reading, and I was like, oh, no, what they just do? <laughs> well, and that's the thing, too, is uh, I'm one of those people, too, where I'll, I'll just read it a sequence. I'll, I'll, I'll read it kind of mess up, and it'll just, I'll just be like, you know, it's fine. I just wanted to know what happened. Uh, and, you know, it's weird. A lot of people didn't like that little run that Batman Inc. had. A lot of people, like, put it down a lot. They're like, oh, it was, it was meh. And I'm like, wow. Oh, I thought it was good. I really liked it. I was like, it's not the old Batman Incorporated. I'm like, well, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not going to be the old Batman Incorporated. <laughs> so I guess another nerd question. Um, are, are you a DC or a Marvel fan? Which one do you prefer? When I was younger, it was it, I was more Marvel, but the older I get, I, the more DC just resonates with me. I like the characters. I like the, the atmosphere of it. I, I'd say at this point, DC is a much better product. Uh, and would you say the same with like the movies? You like the Marvel movies better, or DC movies better? Mm. <clears throat> I I really enjoy the Marvel movies, and right now my favorite, honestly, is is Justice League. I watched it quite a few times. I really I really enjoy. I only got to see half the first half of uh, Infinity War, so that uh, I I haven't got to finish that. So maybe. Maybe we'll take take the cake for Justice League, but I the next thing I'm gonna watch is hopefully tonight or well tomorrow night I'll be I'll be able to uh Deadpool two and see that. Yeah, Deadpool two is really, really good. I really enjoyed it. Um a lot of people I think it was better than the first one personally. Um I mean the first and the first one was obviously fantastic. <laughs> yeah. But uh but I agree. A lot of people disagree with me, but I love DC, I always have. That's been my preference, both comic book and movies. No, I, no one will ever be able to convince me that there's a better comic book movie than Batman: The Dark Knight. Just The Dark Knight, you know. Oh yeah. That one's probably one of the best Mar- comic book movies ever. But definitely, Hell, yeah. That one, Man of Steel. Man of Steel. That was fantastic. Um, uh, I was when I went in to see Man of Steel, I was like half expecting it to be kind of bad, but I was really blown away by how, how well it's done all the way around. And I think a lot of people, obviously, again, some people who don't like comic book movies or comic book, but a lot of people kind of, uh, I think, had a bad taste in their mouth from uh, the Superman Returns with Brandon Mouth in it. I think a lot of people were like, eh, it was the greatest, so they're like, oh, we're not really hurt, sure how to expect from this one. I didn't really care. I mean, I liked it, but I, was, I wasn't, like, blown away by the Superman Returns when they were, I think that was about right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was left wanting more after Superman Returns. Right. And then and we got more, <laughs> eventually. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a while, but yes, definitely got, got something great. And, that, and that's the best thing. It's that sometimes they have to come with time, so patience. Yeah. Patience, patience is a, a virtue, as they say. But uh, I guess kind of a, a way to, I guess, you know, wind the inter- interview back in and down a little bit. Um, every time I talk to somebody who's kind of stepped away from wrestling, they, they always say that there's still that little bit of spark about wanting to back. Um, do you feel that way? Do you feel sometimes that you would go back to wrestling? Or you would to go back to wrestling and be an active participant? No, no, I don't. Uh, no, I don't. I don't it, it, I hit it hard, really hard, for quite a few years, and I think it. <coughs> I think that part kind of it exploded and kind of burned out. So I think it was a it was a great part of my life that I could, I passed it. Like a supernova, burn bright, die young, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. But that, you know, and like you said, you're you're more focused on the family now, and that's, I feel like that's, you know, that, that takes a little more guts than uh, wrestling sometimes. <laughs> Having kids and all that, you know, it, I, I don't know, man. I think I'd much rather take a moonsaw, <laughs> moonsaw than have kids right now. <laughs> I I kid, I kid. But uh, I guess kind of a last question for you here. Um, 
obviously when you were wrestling, I'm not sure how prevalent uh, social media was, but do you have social media now? Fans follow you if they ever want to hit you up and be like, hey, I remember you wrestling this guy or anything like that? Um, I just have, like, my personal, you know, Charles Garland on a book. <coughs> I just have that. And, uh, I, I have some fans that I've that remembered me and was like, hey, man. But, yeah, that's just, I have my face, can, that's it. I think my space is still floating around out there somewhere. I not forever, but it's, it's still alive. I was like, still alive. who's logged into MySpace since, like, 2004? <laughs> Oh God, MySpace that cracks me up. I, I don't even know. I, I'm trying. I'm gonna go look up my MySpace now from when I was like 12. <laughs> oh God. Well, you know, I I want to thank you for you know coming on here, speaking with me, giving me the time just to kind of go over you know your career, talk about comic books and comic movies. A lot of fun. Um, but you know, like you said, guys, you know, if you want to go chat with him, you remember him, and you want to talk about his matches, like you said, go hit him up on Facebook. It's under uh, it's under you said Charles Garland, right? So you there you go. You know how to look him up. Um, check him out. Ask him questions. Tell him that Isaac sent you. Um, and as always with professional wrestling, support independent wrestling. Go watch an independent wrestling show. Um, there's nothing better than independent wrestling. I, I am a very strong believer in that. And welcome back to the Dave Dynasty Show. This is Dave Dynasty. Thank you once again for joining us for this episode. Remember, go to DaveDynasty.com for all of our social media links, all of our links to uh, everything, right? Everything is there. Links to our Pro Wrestling Tees store, uh, links to our Amazon.com affiliate and our HighSpots.com affiliate where we get a little kickback when you shop at those sites. No additional charge to you. Remember, if you'd like to make a monthly ongoing contribution to the show to help support us, help keep us free, you can do that at Patreon.com slash The Dave Dynasty. And if you'd make, like to make just a one-time donation to the show, you can go to PayPal.me slash The Dave Dynasty. We would appreciate that. Uh, Clearly, Ike's having some problems with his equipment on his end. We may have to replace some things, so make some contributions, buy some shirts, so that we can get Ike back where he needs to be. Don't know what's going on there. Once again, I apologize for some of the sound issues that we had today. Remember, October 27th, go to Fort Wayne, Indiana, Heroes and Legends 11. You'll meet all kinds of great talent, past and present. Great show, great event, and plus you get to meet us at the Dave Dynasty Show. Uh, once again, go to ProWrestlingTees.com, buy a shirt, including the new Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. shirt. If you use the promo code AMERICA now through July 6th, you'll get 20% off of everything. Next week, we have a an unbelievable show. This is a guy, a first-time appearance on a podcast. He's never done an interview on a podcast before. We are the first. We've done this before, right? We brought you talent. For the first time before, uh, we have other things lined up in the future in a similar vein. But a Midwest legend. If you watched wrestling in the Midwest, you know this guy. A former commentator for big time wrestling in Detroit. And the voice of Bruiser Bedlam Wrestling. Next episode, we will have Terry Sullivan on. I had a great interview with Terry. It is uh, It was good to talk to him. Good to hear some things from his perspective. And again, first time ever on a podcast here. Next episode on the Dave Dynasty Show. Do not miss it. It will be incredible. I promise you that. Again, until then, uh, remember, be appreciative of the fans uh, and what they do and how they support you. If you are a fan, be positive. Uh, don't be a nuisance to other fans. Be supportive of the wrestlers and the shows and what they do. Hey, let's just all get along, man. Let's just all bring it together. We all love the same thing. Uh, maybe we like different flavors, but we are all pro wrestling fans, whether it's past, present, future, and whatever style it may be. So let's be good to each other. Let's be kind to each other. And uh, remember, folks, uh, go out there and give a hug to those you love. Let's don't wait till they're gone to show our appreciation for them. Uh, let's don't wait till they're gone to pay tribute to them. Uh, if you have a family member, someone you love, a mentor, Someone who is influential, important in your life, and we all have those people. Make sure you tell them. Make sure you tell the world, "Hey, this is a this is an awesome person," and let's do it while they're still with us, and they can enjoy that uh, attention and limelight, especially in the pro wrestling business. Right? Sometimes we forget some of those from the past, some of those that are important until it's too late, right? Until they're gone, and then we we all put out videos and we all do these things and we do special episodes of podcasts and everything else. But 
uh, let's try to honor them. Let's try to recognize them while they're still here so that they can enjoy and know how much we appreciate and love them. So make sure you do that uh, today, tomorrow, and always. And until next time, fans, be good, be safe, and keep on growing. (laughs) 